Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. This is podcast number 14 in the series, the Truth First Christianity podcast. Hey, make sure you're subscribed. Please like the video, uh, make a comment, join the discussion as we go. Today, we're talking about something very heavy. It might be the most real subject in the Christian faith. So I'm going to ask something I've never asked before, and that is for everybody watching this video, just make sure you're right, whether it's just taking a deep breath or saying a prayer, making sure you're centered, because we're talking about something that I found just staggering and alarming information about. Um, so initially, I wanted to gather all the different denominational resources to share what different uh, denominations in the Christian faith believe about exorcism. And through the process, I learned that there is actually not that much disagreement between denominations and that the truth about it is very alarming. Um, I probably prayed more than I've ever prayed before going into making a video, if that gives you any idea. Um, so we might start out sharing some different views from different denominations, but at the end, they're going to merge together. Why am I making this video now? Well, I had something personally happen to my family that... Um, it, first of all, it scared me, and secondly, it demonstrated an, an inconsistency in my faith that I'm building in Christianity. Um, my children found a pile of torn apart, defiled, and burned up rosaries. Rosaries, as you know, were a prayer tool predominantly in the Catholic faith. Um, they're beads, and each bead has a prayer that is said uh, a, a given number of times. Um, it is uh, very popular in Catholicism. It is a uh, prayer tool that they use quite a bit. I had no problem recognizing that these rosaries had been used in some type of occult or ritual abuse. But I noticed that my views were inconsistent because I had no problem believing that, but at the same time, I would view the depth of iconography in the Catholic denomination um, as, as uh, I idolatry. So hold on a second. Wouldn't it be idolatry for me to recognize just these little pieces of uh, stuff as, as, a, as idolatry too, right? If I'm consistent, shouldn't they both be? And that's what got me thinking about this subject. So I want to start um, sharing a few sources with you. This is from the Catholic Herald, and it's regarding the disposal of religious items. In all Protestant denominations, except maybe High Lutheran, Anglican, um, you'd be talking about biblical idolatry with, with this type of subject. But... Um, it, a, a, a Catholics are accustomed to having objects blessed, holy water, rosaries, um, a chalice that's used in the service, maybe a statue that's in the house. Uh, sometimes I get comments about the various things on my wall. Now, if I were to use them in worship, I would consider that idolatry, but minor decoration here for the room and in part to make a nice set with interesting things to look at. But this article says... There's a, there's a process in the Catholic Church for how to dispose of these items. Rosaries are supposed to be buried or burned. Same with palms that are given out on Palm Sunday. Um, chalices are supposed to be recycled. If you want to read about it yourself, you can go to the Code of Canon Law, and it's under uh, number 1171. Um, so let's move on to, with that in mind, uh, can all pastors or priests perform an exorcism? What is it? How does it work? Well, the term exorcist and exorcism really only appear one time in the Bible, but we do see other instances where someone is demon-possessed and the demon is cast out. Um, the fact of the matter is that any true born-again Christian has a power over in the, to the extent that they could not themselves be possessed. A true born-again Christian cannot be possessed. Um, and technically, if we use the Bible, and if you believe in continuation of spiritual gifts, any Christian, true born-again, should have the power to cast out a demon. Um, and, and there's a part in the Bible, right, that I think it's in maybe Mark, and it says, these kind only can be gotten out through fa uh, prayer, and later on they added, and fasting to it. Um, the 70 that were sent out, they cast out demons. They weren't pastors or priests, right? So right away, we have a situation set up where it looks like a discrepancy. The Catholic Church has a whole administrative department 
um, with men who are ordained and specifically uh, charged by a bishop to be an exorcist. Um, we wouldn't see that in Protestant denominations uh, or confessional faiths. Uh, so what does that tell us? Does this appear then right off the bat as a disagreement? Let's hold that off for a second. Um, we have to remember that Jesus rebuked the devil, um, unless you want to end up like the seven sons of uh, Sceva. That, that's from the book of Acts, it, and it talked about how, um, I think I have a direct quote that's going to come up, but basically some of the itinerant exorcists in the Jewish faith um, had seen a person and cast out uh, and, and attempted to cast him out. And then they said, I know this Jesus and I know Paul, but I don't know you. And it did not work out well for that itinerant. They themselves ended up being either oppressed or possessed. Um, in practical terms, no pastor or priest can perform an exorcism because exorcisms presuppose that a, pers uh, a person is possessed by a demon, which never really happens. That's one view. Um, it's certainly not the majority view. Even Baptists, if, it, if we look at this article from Baptist Press that was put out uh, with the uh, an, an article by David Roach from the Southern Theological Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, um, he says, you know, can a Christian be possessed? No, but if someone's in the church and not a Christian, certainly they can be. In fact, just generally evangelical Billy Graham uh, has a list of things to do to cast out demons to say these prayers. So they certainly believe that there, there can be people in the church who maybe aren't really saved, that they can be demon-possessed. So let's take a quick look at... Um, excuse me, sorry for the delay there. I'll get my articles mixed up. Okay, so the Vatican does a class every year on this, and it's a, a course in 2018. They had 250 priests attend from 50 countries, they arrived in Rome to learn how to identify demonic possession and the rituals behind expelling demons. Exorcism remains controversial because of its depiction in popular culture and horror, horror films. Um, the course is described as the only international series of lectures, covers the theological, psychological, and anthropological backgrounds to exorcism. Uh, so... In the news, we keep hearing articles and reading articles that say demand for exorcism is growing. Listen to this, and this is scary. Catholic priests in several countries have told the press there has been an increase in the numbers of people reporting signs of demonic possession. Half a million people reportedly seek exorcisms every year in Italy, while a report by Christian think tank Theos in 2017 said that the practice was also on the rise in the UK in part due to the spread of Pentecostal churches. What's meant there is that uh, Pentecostal churches, uh, their services, we could also say charismatic in general, rely on this idea that the Holy Spirit can, uh, can be called upon and come and that we have our emotional and spiritual outpouring as part of an authentic experience with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're not going to debate that issue today. That's they're saying that this is why, because if these people can gather and call on a good spirit, guess what? Other spirits can get in too. That's basically what's being said. Now, I, this next thing, this next answer by this priest is a terrible answer, and I want to kind of criticize it a little bit. It says Father Gary Thomas, an American priest who's practiced exorcism for 12 years, says one reason for the increase is that as society has begun to rely more heavily on social sciences. Fewer churches have trained exorcists. The decline in Christianity has also led to the increase in superstitious practices. The reason I don't think is a good answer is his answer is a reason why exorcism would decline, not grow. He's saying, oh, well, the need for exorcisms is growing because now all these things that used to be possession are now being properly classified scientifically. Even the Catholic Church itself, in the Catechism, I found uh, about three references to exorcism, and they updated, uh, in 1990s, they updated uh, their right for exorcism, which hadn't been done since the year 1614. Um, so I, I just didn't think that was a good answer. Italian priest uh, Benigno Palia told the Vatican News that the growing use of tarot cards, sorcery, and the occult has led to a renewed demand for exorcisms. I would believe that. 
However, very few cases actually require a major exorcism. There are two distinctions made in that catechism, and I found in other sources too, major and minor exorcism. Minor uh, are the ones where Catholicism says, hey, anybody can perform these. And it would be universally agreed that a Christian, a born-again true Christian, has the power to pr uh, pray for safety against evil, safety against demons, and they also classify a major exorcism, which... Uh, for example, in a 2000 interview on The World Over with Roy Aurora and EWTN, he interviewed the New York head exorcist. Uh, and I forget the priest's name, but he said out of about 180, he might get 12 that are major exorcisms. Um, yeah, here it is here. Yeah, out of 180, um, just a dozen require major exorcisms. What happens in an exorcism? The priest must wear a type of embroidered white tunic called a surplice along a purple stole. The person who's possessed may be bound and holy water should be used. The priest will make the sign of the cross on the person at several times throughout. One thing I think is interesting is you never hear of these situations with major exorcisms where anything related to any Protestant, confessional, or charismatic denomination of the church is used. It always talks about references to Catholic figures, saints, or rosaries. That's one thing that raises my skepticism. Uh, one of the most popular examples of exorcism, I'll read you a few small pieces of this, come from a case that happened in 1973. Uh, the lady's name was Annalise Michel. Uh, and this case actually ended up causing uh, three people of clergy to go to jail because she died during the exorcism, and it was found that she had several things that were now classified as mental illness. So the process, while they believed she was possessed and they tried to prove it in court, didn't stand up. Um, so a couple people went to jail for it. But let, let me give me some latitude and let me read this. It's a little long, but it's you'll find it interesting. In November 1973, Annalise Michel, a young student at the University of Würzburg, West Germany, was taken by her parents to see the parish priest in her hometown of Klingenberg. She had developed some worrisome signs of abnormal behavior at the university, refusing to eat, uh, flying into violent rages, screaming, and trying to attack those around her, and her parents were deeply concerned. In the priest's view, Annalise was possessed by a demon and recommended a ritual exorcism. Uh, on July 1st, 1976, after several months of exorcism, Annalise died of malnutrition and dehydration at the age of 23. In 1978, the two exorcists uh, and Annalise's parents were charged with neglect, I'm sorry, negligent homicide. Uh, for the Roman Catholic Church, the death was a nightmare come true, demonstrating the dangers inherent in ritual exorcism and the murky distinction between priestly and medical responsibilities. Well, they ended up changing that. As I said, they updated from their 1614 rituals to, um, in 1995. Uh, now, this during this demon possession, you listen to the recording and it's creepy. She's making all these sounds and she's talking about, uh, uh, you know, the priest will ask, what's your name? And she's saying, oh, Hitler, Nero, naming all these horrible figures from history. Um, so that case kind of brought it into the popular consciousness both negatively and positively because the other one is the movie The Exorcist that was based on that case that I think happened over in Baltimore. But anyway, let me get to the point here. Uh, there's a YouTube video, World of Catholic Exorcist Father Raphael. It's on a channel called Nowness and it presents a small portion of the filmmaker Ivan Olita's work called uh, Contra Demons. Uh, I wanted to share with you Father Ratcliffe's own words. They do seem to bring clarity. As we can see, there's a lot of differing views on the subject. Uh, that in and of itself means we should probably take it seriously. Now, without coming to any conclusion about exorcism, surely to hear the words of someone whose job it is to do this day in, day out for decades could shed some insight on the subject. First, he ensures that a doctor is always to be consulted first. During the 20th century, we, uh, I explained the update, so we did that. It ensured that people with mental and physical diagnosis would uh, always get treatment uh, and not be misdiagnosed. And that in itself addresses some of the criticisms of misdiagnosis. Anyway, modern exorcist, and he says this, quote, 
The day after my ordination, the bishop asked me to take on this role. I would never have expected that, an exorcist. We study many things about evil and demons, but we often see that people have totally misleading ideas both about evil and demons and frequently about the exorcist himself. I understood that my main mission was to get rid of the ignorance that permeates these themes. The first demon to oust was the general misinformation people fall into. A lot of folks are concerned about minor issues, illness or mental disorders, without realizing how the real demons actually happen around us. It is key to understand that if a person is mentally ill, it would be absolutely illusory and detrimental to perform any exorcism. There is such a big misunderstanding in our world to mistake psychiatric issues with possession and vice versa. To face a real demoniac is an awful experience. First of all, they are absolutely mentally sound, and they use their superior intelligence to hurt. Let's just say it's a terrible encounter when it happens. It's a clash. There is a lot of wickedness with a trail of evil that follows you for a long time. My disgrace has been to find demoniac people in the church. Jesus, after all, found his first demoniac in the synagogue. Exorcism means to recollate the world within the ratio, which is the reason for being for all things around us. And it exists within nature. It's not a law revealed by any religion. It is indeed a natural law. He has more, but let me go to this statement because this is where we see there's not actually differences in view between the denominations. He says, my disgrace has been to find demoniac people in the church. Right. That's what some of the confessional faiths and some of the other Protestant faiths are saying. Look, if this person is a true Christian, they cannot be possessed. Well, he's saying that's what's alarmed him. He's found people in the church who can be possessed, revealing that they're obviously not really saved. They're just churchmen and women. Okay, um, the problem is that people believe that to be possessed by the devil is to be thunderstruck while everything is just fine. But according to the gospel, the reality is very different. When Jesus meets the man possessed by a demon, it is clearly written that the man was inside an evil spirit. That means it is actually the man himself that entered the evil spirit and not the other way around. St. Augustine said the devil would not have any power over you without your consent. There we have it. There is agreement then. Now that puts these people in a whole new light. Because if there's actually agreement when you get to the bottom line and past the subtleties and past the semantics, what are we to make of this? This is basically telling us, yes, this thing is very real. Are you scared yet? Now I want to read you a few things that the early church fathers had to say on this subject. First, I'm going to read you the account in the book of Acts that I was telling you about, um, the sons of Scura or Scarsa. God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. And the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Well, so much for iconography and idolatry. What do we make of that? That's interesting. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the spirits go on to say, We know this Jesus and we know this Paul, but who are you? And the demon jumped out of that person and into that itinerant exorcist. Crazy. Justin Martyr says, uh, Throughout the whole world and in your city, many of our Christian men have healed numerous demon-possessed persons. There we have uh, proof and authentication from the church fathers that, yes, in fact, any true Christian can, to a degree, deal with the possessed. You know, there's something else to point out here. <clears throat> I often hear this criticism from uh, good Catholic apologists, uh, meaning ones that are aware that there's a whole world outside their faith and that, you know, that they teach it very well. Like uh, Taylor Marshall is a good example. Uh, the, the guys at Catholic Answers do this to an extent, too. They will often throw around this thing that says, like, yeah, uh, you know, the Protestant pastors are all good and fine until they need a Catholic exorcist. 
And I, sure enough, I looked up the data and it does happen where people from other denominations are in fact unable. And <clears throat> I assume it's because there is a bureaucracy, a process and a ritual inside Catholicism that it has a structure that works where other things failed. I just found that interesting. I'm not making any claim that it means one is true over the other, but it's tr it can't be ignored. I'm just sharing truth with you as I find it. Uh, Justin Martyr also says, Every demon when exercised in the name of the very Son of God is overcome and subdued. Uh, this is addressed to the pagans by Tertullian. Let a person be brought before your tribunals who is plainly under demon possession. The wicked spirit ordered to speak by a follower of Christ will as readily make the truthful confession that he is a demon as elsewhere he has falsely asserted that he is a god, showing that Jesus has the authority over them. Interesting. Tertullian again. The Lord himself is witness that we have... The case of the woman who went to the theater and came back possessed. Accordingly, in the exorcism, when the unclean creature was rebuked for having dared to attack a believer, he firmly replied, And in truth, I did it most lawfully, for I found her in my domain. That supports what that Catholic priest exorcist was saying about what the Bible really says. The spirit didn't enter the person. The person entered the spirit. The person went into the evil spirit's domain. Listen again, right? We, we have witness in the Lord, the case of the woman who went to the theater and came back possessed. In an exorcism, when an unclean creature was rebuked for having dared to attack a believer, don't say possessed believer, said try to attack him. He firmly replied, and in truth, I did it most lawfully. For I found her in my domain. Whew, this stuff is creepy. We daily hold them up to contempt. We exercise them from their victims as multitudes can testify. That is Tertullian again. Oh, boy. So we found agreement because the Catholic exorcist said St. Augustine said the devil would not have any power over you without your consent. That being said, it is pretty clear that real demoniacs run away from the church and obviously run away from the exorcist. Our purpose is mostly to help people avoid falling into evil and free them once they fall into it. Let's say, though, that freeing people through our help and intervention could only happen if the person leaves a glimmer as long as we are alive, we can exercise our free will. Oh, come on, friend. I was making the connection that there was agreement, and now he says free will. The Calvinists are going to go crazy. Different subject, guys. We're talking about exorcism here. And as the saying goes, where there is breath, there is hope. That is what he ends with. I thought that was very interesting. Whew. So this subject... I, oh, man, I just prayed. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. Let me finish up. So every year in the Vatican, they have a class that they teach about exorcism and the rites and how to do it. And apparently, pastors and priests from every denomination go there. Um, there are, uh, in here it said, I thought it was interesting, um, you know, sometimes people don't even believe any of this is true till they have an experience with one of their parishioners or congregation whom they feel they're obligated to provide soul care for. And they have this encounter and they're like, oh, my, what do I do? You know, um, that is really fascinating to me. All right. So there it is. Do with it what you will. Um, let me tell you the names real quick of these articles and books and sources. This is from. Mysteries of the Unexplained, we did the Early Church Fathers, I've got Unger's Dictionary, I've got the Catechism of the Church, articles from uh, Quora, which was just a secular site, uh, Baptist Press, we did Catholic Herald, we did BBC News World Europe, which talked about the class that the Vatican offers, I told you about the video, which I'll put a link to in the description, where you can watch that commercial for that movie the guy made about the exorcist a couple things coming up i want to tell you about in the coming days i'm going to be interviewing a oneness pentecostal pastor a wonderful young man who i've known for years i knew him before and now after his ordination and i'm watching his church grow and we're going to interview him and we're going to talk about some of the things we've talked about trinity versus oneness um, the charismatic movement, all these things we're going to have uh, conversations about over there by the fireplace. 
Uh, so that's going to be coming within the next week. Um, I also want to ask you please to um, subscribe, like the video, um, share it, share it with people, um, or share another video that you like from the channel. Um, please make a comment, ask a question. Uh, we can keep the discussion going down in the comments or on Twitter at Evangelist Nick G or Facebook at Evangelist Nick G. You can find me there. Uh, also, BitChute Evangelist Nick G. Um, you can also subscribe to my other channel, Nonfiction History about the Ancestors of George Washington, a book I wrote which is doing very, very well. It is on Amazon and it's on the shelves at George Washington's birthplace in Virginia. Friends, uh, I want to thank you for your time and say God bless you, God love you, and may your work today bear fruit. Don't be too heavy hearted about this. It's uh, worth studying, worth looking into, but those people who are born again in Christ know that we are safe and we can help others maybe to find the way. Talk to you later.